Hi everyone. I'd like to talk today about graphing motion. We'll start off by talking about how we construct and interpret graphs of position, displacement, velocity, and time, velocity and acceleration as a function of time. And then also talk a little bit about what the slopes and areas of these graphs mean and how we can interpret them and use them to help us solve problems. So to start off, let's talk about particle diagrams. These are also known as dot diagrams or ticker tape diagrams. And it's very similar to thinking about you driving your car, but you have a very slow oil leak. At a set interval of time, a drop of oil falls down onto the pavement. As that happens, later on, if you went and looked at the asphalt, the pavement, you would have a pretty good idea of what your car was doing. So for example, if we look at this top graph here, as our car is moving to the right, you can see that we have oil drops evenly spaced on the pavement. So our particle diagram, or ticker tape diagram, would look like this down below, evenly spaced drops. When we see that, we can interpret that for a couple different meanings. Since they have the exact same width spacing between each oil drop, we know our car must have been moving at a constant velocity. What we can't tell, however, is whether the car was moving left or right based on just the particle diagram. Now, if instead we had our car accelerating to the right with the same leak still dropping oil at the constant uh, interval between drops, we would see something kind of like this. The first drops, as it was moving very slowly, would be close together, and over time they'd get further and further and further apart. That shows our car accelerating to the right, something we could see with the ticker tape diagram. On the other hand, how could you tell the difference from a car accelerating to the right to a car that is accelerating to the left? And by accelerating, remember, we've got to think whether positive or negative acceleration. This could also be a car that is going fast and slowing down as it moves to the left. Now, since velocity and acceleration Positives and negatives all depend on the axis you call positive. You've got to be very careful in understanding that negative acceleration does not necessarily mean slowing down. Negative acceleration means you are accelerating in the direction that you called negative. So can you think of a case in which the car could have a negative velocity, a negative acceleration, and yet be speeding up? Well, if we called right positive, and left negative, if our car was moving to the left and it had a negative acceleration, so its velocity and acceleration vectors are both pointing in the same direction, it will be going faster and faster and faster to the left. Displacement time graphs. These show displacement as a function of time, obviously. As an example, if we have a dog that starts at her origin at zero, zero and wanders away from her house at a constant rate of one meter per second, constant velocity of one meter per second, we'll call that the positive direction away from the house, then we would see displacement changing at a consistent rate for five seconds. And at the end of five seconds, the dog would have gone five meters. So at five seconds, the dog decides to take a rest. So the dog rests for five seconds. Displacement of the dog does not change during that five seconds. It has no velocity. Then the dinner bell rings, the dog gets all excited, and the dog runs back to the house at two meters per second till it gets to the house here two and a half seconds later. Now there's a lot we can learn from this graph. For example, if we look at the slope of this graph, the slope of the displacement time graph gives you the velocity. So the slope during this first interval, if we found the slope of that, slope is rise over run. And we have a rise. We go from 0 to 5 meters. So our rise was 5 meters. And our run, we went from 0 to 5 seconds. So that's over 5 seconds gives us our velocity of 1 meter per second, which we already knew from the problem statement. Then, over the next five seconds, the dog's at rest. Well, the slope of a horizontal line is zero, so v equals zero there. And finally, on the way back to the house, now we calculate our slope as rise over run, but the rise now, well, it drops 
five meters. So its rise is negative five meters. The run is 2.5 seconds. So we get a slope of negative two meters per second. The dog's going faster toward the house, but in the negative direction. So the slope of a displacement time graph gives you the velocity at that instant in time. If we made a plot of this, for in the first five seconds, the dog's velocity was a constant one meter per second. Then the dog took a rest for five seconds. The slope was zero. Therefore, the dog's velocity was zero. See how these line up? And over the last two and a half seconds, the slope was negative two. So we have a line for velocity for two and a half seconds at negative two meters per second. So if we know the displacement time graph, we can figure out the velocity time graph by taking the slope. We could also go look at the area under the velocity time graph. If we look at a velocity time graph and go the opposite direction, let's take the area under the graph. And as we do this, let's make sure we realize that the zero line of our graph is right there. There's the zero point. So if we want to find out the area under the velocity time graph will look for what this green area is. How do you find the area? Well, that looks like a rectangle to me, so I'd say that area is equal to length times width. Our length is five seconds. Our width is one meter per second. Multiply that out, I get five meters. Well, we know that the dog moved a distance of five meters in that five seconds. So at five seconds, we have a value of five meters. It works out. Then the area under here, under the graph, between zero and our velocity time curve is zero. So displacement stays the, stays the same. There's no change in the dog's displacement. And in the last two and a half seconds, let's switch to another color here so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, we'll take a brighter red we have another rectangle. Now the area of that rectangle, length times width, is two and a half seconds. The width of that is negative two meters per second, which gives us negative five meters. The dog's displacement from 10 seconds to 12 and a half seconds was negative five. So if it started at five, it has add negative five to that, we come back to zero, back to our starting point. So if we have displacement time and we want to go to, the vol to velocity time, we take the slope. If we have velocity time and we want to go to displacement, we take the area under the graph. Now the slope of a VT graph, if we take the slope of the velocity time, curve, we get the acceleration. For example, in a problem from a recent Regents exam, what's the acceleration of a car at t equals five seconds when we're given a velocity time graph? Well, all we have to do is go over here to five seconds, and at five seconds, let's take the slope right there. At five seconds, our line runs that direction, and the slope of a horizontal line again, zero. So, pardon me, that's not velocity. Our acceleration is the slope of the VT graph, which is zero. So our acceleration must be zero. It's not accelerating at five seconds, which makes sense because at five seconds, right before it and right after it, its velocity is still 10. Its velocity isn't changing. Therefore, that's the definition of acceleration. It's no, no change in velocity, no acceleration. Next question, what's the total distance traveled by the car during the six second interval? Well, we have a VT curve. We want to find distance traveled. That's the area under the VT curve. And to do that, uh, it looks like I have two different shapes I can break this up into. I have a triangle on the left, and the area of a triangle is one half times height. And over here on the right side, I have a rectangle. Area equals length times width. All we need to do is add those up. So the area under our total curve is the area of that triangle, one half base height, plus the area of our rectangle, length times width. I'll mm -hmm. substitute in width units. Base of my triangle is four seconds. Height of my triangle is 10 meters per second, 
plus the length of my rectangle is 2 seconds because the length of my rectangle is from 4 to 6 seconds and the height of my rectangle or the width is that distance there which is 10 meters per second. Little bit of math, 1 half times 4 times 10 that's going to be 20 meters plus 2 times 10 20 meters in both cases our seconds will make a ratio of 1 or cancel out for a total distance traveled of 40 meters. Pretty slick. Now if we look at acceleration time graphs, if you take the slope of the VT graph again, you get the acceleration. If you take the area under an acceleration time graph, you get the change in an object's velocity, just like taking the area under a velocity time graph gave you a change in the object's displacement. So if you wanted to look at this and try and look at the whole thing, if you start with a DT graph on the left, if you want to go to a VT graph, you take the slope. If you want to go from a VT graph to an AT graph, you take the slope. So anytime you're moving to the right, you take the slope. If you want the change in an object's velocity and you have an AT graph, to go to the left, you take the area. And if you have a VT graph and you want to change in an object's displacement, you take the area. And if we look at the examples that are given here even, our DT graph has a constantly increasing slope. At the bottom, its slope is close to zero. At the higher end, it has a higher slope. That means that when we take the VT graph, at the lower end, at time zero, its velocity is zero. And as you get to larger and larger values of time, you have higher and higher velocities. Therefore, you get a line. Now to find the acceleration from that middle VT graph, we take the slope. The slope of a straight line is constant, and because this is a positive slope, we would have a positive value for acceleration. So let's take a look at one last sample question. Which graph best represents the motion of a block accelerating uniformly down an inclined plane? So we're given a bunch of DT graphs, and we know that the object is accelerating uniformly. Well, if it's accelerating uniformly, that means its velocity is changing. So its VT graph probably looks something like this. We would imagine that its velocity is increasing the further it slides down a plane. Common sense, right? Well, if we have a VT graph like this, that means when we draw our DT graph, Let's see if we can't get a color that stands out a little bit better. When we draw our DT graph, the VT graph comes from the slope of the DT graph. So, at time zero, we have a velocity of zero. That means on our DT graph, we must have a slope of zero over here. As we go a little bit later on in time, we have a higher velocity, so we must have a higher slope. A little bit later on in time, higher velocity still and higher velocity still. So over here, we must have greater and greater slopes. And if we connect this, we get this parabolic shape. So we start off with zero slope and move to very high slopes, giving us this VT graph. If we then drew the AT graph just to check everything, the slope of our VT graph is a constant positive. So our AT graph must be a straight line. That shows constant uniform acceleration, which is what we wanted. Correct answer, the only graph that meets these requirements is number four. So, next steps. Try taking 15 seconds or so and walk in a straight line back and forth, but change your speeds. Stop every now and then. Accelerate. Try walking at a constant speed. Once you're done for that 15 seconds, see if you can go draw the DT, VT, and AT graphs for your motion. Then, if you have a friend, and I hope you do, have them do the same thing. Then swap graphs. See if based on their graphs of DT, VT, and AT, you can walk in the same manner that they did, and vice versa. Of course, if you need more information, feel free to check out aplusphysics.com. Thank you.